chapter 8, the announcement. Anne, can I borrow your French homework? I didn't get the chance to finish mine, said Andrews. I turned to look at him. If you ever came up to me and said, Cam, I don't need to borrow your homework because I've done it, I think I'd faint with shock. Oh, go on, Andrew pleaded. Here you are. I couldn't keep the long-suffering sigh out of my voice, but I want it back before the end of the first lesson. Understand? Andrew grinned. Great, thanks. Andrew, can you lend me Cam's homework when you're finished? asked Bran. You lot could try doing your own homework instead of copying mine all the time, I said, exasperated. Why have a dog and bark yourself, said Bran. My mouth fell open. You, you certainly can't have it after that, Bran laughed. Only teasing. Yeah, right. The first bell had sounded, so we had five minutes to get to class. I looked at the blue sky, dotted here and there with white clouds. It was such a beautiful day. The morning sunshine felt warm and welcome on my face. It was the kind of day where your slightest wish could come true. All you had to do was ask. It's just a shame we'd be cooped up in a classroom until break time. Marlon, Andrew, Bran and I walked across the school grounds to get to class. I looked around at all the other kids and grown-ups milling around. Not that I'd ever admitted it to anyone, but I quite like school. Julie and Nina from our class walked right in front of us, their arms linked. They were obviously posing. Why do girls always walk together with their arms linked? It's as if they're afraid they'll keel over if they have to stand up by themselves. Judy smiled. Hi, Cam. I could feel my face begin to burn. Hi, Judy. Guess what? I'm going to be in an ad on telly. Are you? Really? What ad? When's it coming out? Next week. Oh, I'll definitely watch it. Not surprised, though. You're pretty enough to be on the telly. Stunned, I stared at Julie. I couldn't believe what I had just blurted out. Where on earth had that come from? Now, all I wanted was a hole to open up and swallow me all the way down to New Zealand. Nina started laughing. Everyone was laughing, except Marlon. He just shook his head. He knew what I was like. Sometimes I suffered badly from foot and mouth disease. Julie smiled again. I was only pulling your leg, Cam. I just wanted to see what your reaction would be. And it was worth it. Shame, shame, shame. The world was emblazoned on across the sky in huge letters and great godlike hands were pointing directly at me. How could I be such a ginormous nit? Everyone was laughing harder than now. Oh, all right. Why was I so gullible? Cam, I only pulled the legs of boys I like, Judy told me softly. Past the sick bag, Marlon soft scoffed. You're just jealous, Judy told him. Me? I didn't know what to think. I even managed to smile at Julie. But only just. <gasps> she liked me. That made her teasing worth it, almost. Cam, can I borrow your maths homework? Just check I've done it right, Judy asked with a smile. Sure. I dug into my bag. The bag fell on the floor. I took a step forward to get it and ended up standing on it. I tried to pick it up, but suddenly my hands were sweaty and I dropped it again. When I finally managed to pick up the bag, you could have fried two eggs on my red face. I got out my bat maths homework and handed it straight to her. Can I borrow it after Julie? Marlon asked. I didn't get the chance to finish mine. How come you don't whinge when Julie asked to borrow your homework? Bran smiled. Andrew stared. What? Maths? Homework? Bran, if you wore a skirt and batted your eyes at Cam, I'm sure he'd lend you his homework. Bog off both of you, I replied. What? Maths? Homework? Andrew was beginning to panic now. Andrew, you can borrow it after Julie, I told him. Julie winked. Thanks, Cam. You're a real pal. I would have lent him a homework without all the lovey-dovey stuff. I really like Julie. But at that moment, all I wanted her to do was disappear. She must have read my mind, because she and Nina sauntered off. You fancy Julie, don't you? Marlon teased. It's the only I could hear. That's a lie. Who said I did, I scowled? No one, but my eyeballs work just fine. She obviously likes you as well. Why didn't you just ask her out? I looked around quickly. But Andrew and Bran were too busy talking to hear our conversation. They were discussing how best to copy my homework. So why didn't you just ask her out? 
Marlon repeated. Shh, keep your voice down, I beg. Besides, if she said yes, I'd think it's because I was ill. And if she said no, I'd think it's because I'm ill. Marlon gave me a look. It must be hard work being you. It is. Oh, before I forget, here you are. I dug into my bag and took out a crumpled piece of paper. What's this? asked Marlon. The maths homework. I copied it out for you. Marlon grinned and snatched it out of my hand. You're welcome, I said dryly. Oh, Cameron, can I have a word? I turned my head. Sticky Stuart, our class teacher, came running up to me. We all called him Sticky behind his back because he was tall and lanky and reminded everyone of a stick insect. To be honest, I've been the one that had come up with the name. I don't even meant it as a joke. I hadn't expected it to take off the way it had. Yes, sir, I frowned. Can I have a word in private? Can. We'll see you in class, Marlon said to me, giving the teacher a suspicious look. I watched as my friends walked away before turning back to the teacher. I've heard from your mum and dad that you'll be away from next week and for some considerable time. I froze. What had mum and dad said? And why hadn't they warned me first? You're going to have a heart transplant, right? I nodded. Would you mind if I told the rest of the class? I'm sure they'd all like to join with me in wishing you the very best of luck. What else did mum and dad say? Miss Stewart raised his eyebrows. That was it, really. Why? Is there anything else? No, no. So I can tell the class? Yeah, I guess so. Good. Mrs. Stewart be beetled off before I had the chance to change my mind, which I was just about to do. He bounced across the school grounds with his loping, leaping walk that I knew, even if I ran after him, I'd never catch up with him. What was wrong with letting the class know I was going to have a heart transplant? Only Marla knew the true facts, and he wouldn't say anything. Why was I upset? Oh, still trying to work it out, I made my way to class. I was in the corridor, only about three metres away from my classroom, when I saw the worst face in the world. I didn't bother to hide the groan that passed through my entire body. Look who it isn't, Mr Muscles himself. Here we go again, I sighed. Travis Cross. The year hard nut had spotted me and was now heading straight for me, followed by his cronies. Just behind him, Marlon came out of the classroom. What do you want, Travis? I asked wearily. A look at a real, live, walking, talking weed, Travis told me. Travis, hadn't you got something better to do? Marlon scoffed. Like a sticky head in a food processor? Marlon to the rescue again. Travis gave me such a look of contempt that I flinched in spite of myself. I can take care of myself, I told him, and Marlon. Yeah, right. <laughs> One puff and we could blow you over. Blow you over? Blow you down the corridor more like. You can try, I said, squaring up to him. You're not even a challenge. It'd be like taking sweets from a baby. Hardly worth my while. Bog off then, Marlon told him. Travis carried on walking, deliberately barging into me. And to my shame, he did almost knock me over. Marlon rushed forward to help. I'm all right, I said impatiently. Don't fuss, I'm okay. Marlon backed off immediately. Come on then, before we're late. I turned to watch Travis and his friends laughing as they sauntered down the corridor. At that moment, I really hated Travis and his friends. I followed Marlon into class, wondering if I'd always be so ineffectual. Travis was right. I was a weed. How are you feeling, Marlon asked. Fine, I said. Even though I was reading through the last remaining piece of homework I'd been left with, I could sense Marlon was still watching me. What's the problem? Cameron, whatever happens, we will always be friends, won't we? Where did that come from, I asked, surprised. We will always be friends. Of course. Why wouldn't we be friends? At that moment, Mr Stewart entered the room. Settle down, settle down. You're my best friend, Camp, said Marlon. I wouldn't want anything to change that. Marlon, why? Quiet, please. I said, quiet, please. Mr Stewart yelled at the top of his lungs to make himself heard. I just wanted to say, Marlon whispered to me. I'm sorry, Marlon. Am I disturbing your conversation? Mr Stewart was a sulky old trout, but at that moment, he did make me laugh. Sorry, sir. That's better. Now, I have an important announcement to make. 
This is Cameron's last day at school for a while. He's going into hospital next week to have a heart transplant. Marlon gasped behind, beside me. I glanced at him, then found it hard to turn away from the shocked expression on his face. So I'm sure you'll all join with me in wishing him a speedy recover, recovery and let him know we'll keep him in our thoughts and prayers. I bent my head, wishing the teacher would shut up. He was embarrassing me as something chronic. And maybe some of us could come and visit you while you're in hospital, he suggested. Would you like that? I looked and smiled wanely. I couldn't think of anything I'd hate more. It was bad enough. Teachers and my friends already treated me as if I was about to snuff it at any moment. Without them seeing me in hospital after a major operation? No. No, thank you very much. Cameron, would you like to come to the front and say a few words? A few words? No way. Uh, no thanks, I said out loud. How could he show me up like that? Say a few words. Are you sure? Mrs Stewart smiled. The more he smiled, the more I scowled, until I felt as if, an ang as if the anger inside me was about to make me pop. Are you really sure? Mrs Stewart fixed me with what he obviously thought was an encouraging smile. I stood up. What are you doing? Marlon whispered urgently. He pulled my sleeve, but I shrugged him off. I walked to the front of the class. I'm due to have a heart transplant operation. Mrs Stewart scraped his chair. Sorry, he said. Carry on, Cameron. I've been reading about exactly what they do. First, they take a razor-sharp scalpel, which is like a knife and an ultra-thin blade. Then they slice your skin from above here to oil, maybe way down here. I stuck my finger in my belly button. I don't think they cut you that far, but I wasn't going to stop now. And then they take a saw and then... Cameron... This isn't exactly what I had in mind. Mr. Stewart leapt to his feet, appalled. I'm sorry, sir. I thought you wanted to tell everyone about heart transplants. I'm getting to the good stuff now. Oh, two pages. No, I think that's quite enough, Mr. Stewart said firmly. But I don't understand. I thought you could talk to us about what will happen next week without being quite so graphic, he said. I looked around the classroom. Mr Stewart wasn't the only one who looked appalled. I'd only meant it as a joke. But more than one shocked face stared back at me. Julie's eyes glistened and her lips were turned down. Andrew actually looked sick. Even Marlon looked upset. My joke had backfired. I took a deep breath. Look, it's not as bad as it sounds, I started again. It's just, our hearts are well protected. When you think about it, we can do most... Without most of our bodies, if we had to, except our brains or hearts. Our brains are well protected by skulls, and our hearts are protected behind a rib cage. So they have to move the rib cage out of the way to get at the heart. That's all. And think about it. Every other part of our body gets a rest when we sleep, but not our hearts. They have to keep pumping, pumping, pumping. It's a strong muscle that needs to last us all our lives. Sometimes, like in my case, something's gone wrong and it has to be replaced. So that's what's going to happen to me. They're going to replace my heart. I'll be unconscious, and that's the way I'll stay till the doctors are finished, so I won't feel a thing. And besides, heart transplants are common operations now. They're as common as taking out your appendix. I knew that wasn't quite true, but it had the desired effect. Mrs Stewart was beginning to smile again, and everyone else looked a little less worried. It was strange. But at that moment, it was as everyone in the class was on my side. It was a good feeling. I was cared about. I belonged. I'm sorry about before. I didn't mean to scare anyone. That's all right. Mrs Stewart's lighthouse beam was back. Let's give Cameron a big round of applause. A couple of people started clapping. Then everyone joined in. I had never been so humiliated in my life. I scowled at the back of Mrs Stewart's head. He had made me very sorry. I hadn't continued my original description of a heart operation. It seemed to me that was all grown-ups ever did. They either talked down to you, ignored you, or showed you up something chronic. I just hoped I wouldn't grow up to be a grown-up like that. And that's the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9 next is Messages.